Great to be here. Um, so, I'm Alex Jenkins. Uh, I'm from Nexus Studios. Uh, Nexus has been going for around 20 years now. Uh, over that time, we've built a strong reputation in animation, film, and interactive projects. Um, I'm just diving straight in here, no pleasantries. <laughs> uh, despite its diversity of work, um, um, I'd say Nexus is at its heart a storytelling studio. Um, we like to leverage the power of narrative to beguile and connect with people, uh, to put it simply, otherwise I'll be describing all sorts of projects. Um, as the creative director of a department inside Nexus called Interactive Arts, my role is to kind of further pursue that thought by um, exploring the possibilities uh, to create engagement um, with people using new mediums, new technologies and techniques, or Sometimes I like to start thinking about it as I look for the stories in places that you may not expect to find them. So, um, for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about a topic I call breaking into reality. Um, I kind of summarized it on the website. It was like, it's a new kind of reality is starting to appear directly on top of the world we live in. Um, uh, I described it as like an invisible magic skin. You may have heard of other terms like the metaverse, um, you know, which essentially enables bricks and mortar, concrete buildings to have more identities, to um, have imaginary creatures wander around on the streets around us. So we can have this new virtual layer that can inhabit the same spaces as us and allow us to tell new stories, if you like. Um, these are alternative realities, if you like, that hopefully once we get the glasses on our face, um, we'll be much closer to walking down the streets, coexisting next to or intertwined with. Um, the beauty of this is it's not like an old cinema. We will be able to engage in them at any moment we wish. You know, in turn, they will also respond to us. You know, it's not a one-way communication. Um, they'll be updating in real time. So um, it's a really <laughs> interesting time. Uh, I'd call them realities as well, because obviously whilst there's theoretically one virtual map that will go over our existing cities and places, um, we as storytellers can publish many forms of these stories over on top of it again and again and again, and I can plug into what I like, what I'm interested in, too. it can be contextually aware. This is a very exciting moment to be investigating this space. So, I mean, I think this wonderful video, it's not great resolution, it's a, it's a Snapchat lens. You may have seen this one, I thought it was absolutely wonderful. There's just this whale casually swimming in the sky, you know, just done by segmenting the sky, knocking out all that nice clear blue space, automatically ignores the buildings and the lampposts and does a really nice job of converting um, you know, the buildings and giving me some occlusion that makes it all the more believable in the space. And this is the kind of illusions that we're going to be talking about today and the technologies that make it better and better. Um, but how are we going to navigate this brave new world? Um, you know, what are its rules? Uh, what can I expect from it? Um, how do I even find it? Uh, maybe it's a little like this, you know, what is the new language of interaction going to be? So um, I'm sure some of you out here, have, or many of you have probably seen this film by now. It's been out quite a number of years. It's made by a director called Keiichi Matsuda. It's called Hyper Reality. And it's, you know, it's pretty hilarious, right? I think it sets a wonderful precedent for the kind of digital reality we don't want. Um, but even in its absurdity, I, I think it, it, 
makes you wonder about, well, you know, because if we don't think about the rules for this world or how we should switch it on or off or at what point should I engage, you know, would it be like this onslaught of things hitting you in the face? You know, we all saw the Google uh, glasses coming out and they were trying to make these little contextually aware things happening in the corner of our vision. Um, this is all working towards this kind of semantic language that we're supposed to, you know, put on top of a layer of us just walking down the street. So, yeah, it's a like a warning to us all. Um, but this is, in a sense, right now, it's our opportunity to consider more intuitive forms of engagement. Uh, you know, we are still, if you like, peering into the metaverse through these windows on our mobile phone, so there's still a, a barrier there, but it is a gateway. You know, it's, it's, uh, we can start to break down the, the, the logic we've created through keyboard and mouse and touch interactions, which are surface solutions. And the more you can believe in the three-dimensional form existing in the world and the street around you, the more we can start to think about other types of tools that we were born with, you know, as we navigate the world, our hands, the way we gaze, the way we respond to things through voice, we can start to use them more as our interaction mechanics. And that's really quite exciting. Um, so my aim in the next half hour or so is to take you on a bit of a journey, uh, nexuses and, and much of my own for my career working in, in the interactive space. I'm always looking for creative solutions <laughs> using interactions. Uh, how we've kind of felt our way into this new spatially led storytelling environment. Uh, it's by no means a definitive guide because I don't think there's ever been any rules coming. There probably will be in the next five to 10 years. Um, it's just one possible journey. Um, to find it an exciting new medium, and I, you know, maybe it'll be exciting enough for you guys to want to go on a journey like that yourself. So I'm gonna, I dug out a few really old projects and then some that are a bit more new just to like uh, make the point, um, you know, because it's not like we, I woke up in the morning and we said, hey, let's build a new digital reality on top of the world, and we had all the tools available. It just didn't really happen like that. Um, you know, it's an accumulation of learnings through uh, many, many different interactive projects and made over many years and a lot of mistakes and a lot of learnings that build the next and the next and the next one. But, you know, the, the thing that stays the same is you're always pushing at the edges, trying to see what happens if I hack the technology this way or what if I use it in that way, what, what kind of results will I get, you know? So how can I engage differently with my audience and make an emotional connection with them? Um, yeah, I think the, I, the handful I picked out, and there could be many others, uh, do attempt in one way or another, whether directly or indirectly, to blur that boundary between, shall we say, conventional reality and the unexpected. I mean, this is, this is just an image, really. Uh, it's not worth playing the video, but it's an old installation uh, we built many years ago for the Royal London Hospital um, called Woodland Wiggle, but there is an interactive experience in the TV set happening there, powered by Kinect. Um, but the thing I pulled out, I really loved, was the fact that we dressed the scene. We added a layer of narrative, we oversized the room, and it felt like, honey, I shrunk the kids. It, that in itself was an act of transformation, and to me that still remains exciting because it, it helps you break your feeling of, I'm in a normal room, and then this massive chair's there. I fundamentally changed the way I feel about the space. Um, or another really old project when we were looking at touchscreen technologies, you know, um, we were invited to create a painting for Dulwich Picture Gallery, the idea being it's a living painting, so when you interact with it, the suddenly what appeared to be a photograph started to play and move. All early experiments in thinking about the flat surface and, and windows through. Uh, or maybe it's just the simplicity of a printed magazine that comes to life. I mean, I'm not playing the AR part of that. I think we've all seen plenty of them by now, but I put that one in because my favorite bit about that is actually the printed illustration just starts to slide across the surface of the magazine and feel alive and vibrant. And that tiny little bit in itself just tips the way I'm perceiving the reality of the printed uh, cover. So that's what I mean about these little things you learn, those little devices you take away for empowering better and more convincing ways to create these uh, illusions. Um, and it's not always fictitious uh, topics that we try to bring into this 
uh, in the real world to AR. We just recently finished uh, a project with Google Arts and Culture and uh, CERN, those of the Large Hadron Collider, and um, where we attempted to recreate the seconds, the fractions of seconds after the Big Bang in AR as if it were happening in your own living room. Um, after a year of trust trying to understand the physicists, uh, yeah, we finally made this product and um, our inspirational starting point was this notion where the origin of the universe can be anywhere. It can be in this room, it can be on this stage, it could even be in the palm of my hand. It's really <laughs> a, a trippy concept, you know, if I flew a spaceship to the center of the universe, uh, it doesn't matter because it's here where I'm standing already. And I was like, okay. So, yep, um, this is a little trailer for it. Um, I'm not showing you too much because I want to push on and talk about the AR. The Big Bang. Mm. The moment a tiny speck <laughs> packed with energy suddenly expanded, giving birth to space and time. And our solar system is born 13.8 million years after the Big Bang. You too could be a part of the next big discoveries about our universe. I mean, if you uh, have time, uh, check it out. It's on the Play Store and on Apple Store as well. Um, yeah, and we're super happy to be nominated for BAFTA for that one. So fingers crossed there, uh, probably because we bagged Tilda Swinton. So that's probably the clincher. Um, I just want to show another installation project. Um, because I think there's, there's value in the learnings of these for what I'm getting to about real world um, location based storytelling. Um, this one is a pretend tourist office uh, that we built for Google Cloud at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And uh, this animated character responds to your voice and she tries to tell you more about oh, the different destinations that you want to go to. Um, that in itself was enough to help people kind of suspend their belief because they see an animated character on the screen. and and then you're asked to say where you want to go, and she responds to you. But then we added a few extra touches, which I think really kind of tipped it over, so I'll just play this. Oh, hello. Mm. You look really cold. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, where would you like to go today? Sao Paulo. My doctor friend's over there. She's using this Google Cloud-powered AI app to help diagnose diseases hundreds of times every day. Uh, I, to to I know someone there. They're flying drones over fruit farms. California. I know someone there. He's scanning thousands of hours of ocean noise fast so they can spot where the whales are and help protect where they call home. Like here. <laughs> There's a world of AI stories out there. Go explore. So whilst not directly uh, part of the kind of metaverse conversation we're having, I, I wanted to include it because these kind of, shall we say, human computer interactions that we're learning, these little tricks we're playing in these installations actually can be carried into the virtual universe that we're building, um, especially as the AI is starting to become more spatially aware and contextually aware of the real world environment. So obviously things like, yes, I'm just responding to my voice, making eye contact, gaze, um, the little things that were super nice that uh, were happening there, like the real heater that came on, and then the, 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 the surprise at the end when this creepy little blue hand came out of the dispenser and gave you a real postcard. I mean, they're just funny. <laughs> so, but yeah, these are great learnings. So we absorb that and then try and build these virtual realities. Um, for us, this is an old one as well, but uh, th this is, I think, when the AR bug really hit the collective imagination in Nexus um, with the creation of this character, the Gruffalo. Are, are you familiar with the Gruffalo here? Good. <laughs> so you know the story. It's the little mouse who obviously wants to get eaten by the fox, and he makes up an excuse about this scary monster living in the forest, and obviously... So then the fox is like, well, well, I think I'd like to see this. And, uh, and then obviously they meet other carnivores along the way. Pretty macabre, right? <laughs> um, and he's staying his execution by lengthening the tail. So, yeah, so we decided to make the monster and stick it in a forest and have little kids go off and find it and essentially replay the story. 
Uh, and I think actually seeing that happen, we, we just bring a story like that and actually walking through a forest and having a story unfold in that way in the context of that environment, we realized something really special was happening here, you know? Um, I want to play a very short clip of it. So obviously we had to use markers uh, then, and each of those markers you would find on a trail we'd plotted out through a woodlands would reveal each character along the story. I mean, this was made pre-Apple's AR kit and pre-AR core, so there's no plane detection, just good old markers, but funnily enough, for a forest trail, that's really handy, actually, because <laughs> something's got to stay there and you've got to find something. We would handle this quite differently now. I mean, also in terms of technology, like we used animation to fake the idea that the character's acknowledging people around them when they go in for a little group shot together, but if we did that now, we'd just use face recognition. So I know you're here and I would move it that way. And, and, and that's the thing, when you keep coming back and iteratively being able to prove on things. Um, I mean, I think I'd say that the, the big changing success for the AR pushing through was obviously around this time, it's mobiles. You know, the, the data connections are faster, um, it, there's less dead spots. Um, the mobiles have improved, the camera technologies have improved, and, and that just really allowed AR, which had obviously appeared some seven years before, to just really work this time. Um, so then the next project that kind of, where we kind of turned our next corner, I don't know, maybe you've met the hot stepper along the way. Um, this is obviously, we jumped on AR kit and AR core pretty quickly, so we could lose the marker, um, and we just, I think asked ourselves a question. You know, we um, we wondered if a virtual character could walk anywhere because most of the time these characters were you spawn them on the spot they, they're attached to the marker or even even on a Pokemon Go. You know, you, you go somewhere and that character just appears there, but it, it's there and that's it. So they're kind of like trapped. So this was like, well, what happens if the character, if, if he's meant to inhabit our world, he should be free to wander around with you like an imaginary friend. So we set out trying to solve that. And the particular scenario for this is we just opened our LA office. So it's like, could one of our characters escape from the London studio and go off to LA? Hence him wearing the super tight speedos. He's so excited to get to the beach that he just leaves in his swimwear. Um, I, I, it's quite old, so I'm not playing the whole story, but I guess this gives you a little bit of a sense of what we tried to do, you know. Um, so you literally, the way this worked in the end was it, it kind of became a novel wayfinder. I, I wouldn't rely on this guy if I were you. He's untrustworthy. <laughs> but um, you put in, you know, you use the map kind of feature. You say, I want to walk from here, let's say, back to my hotel, and this guy can take you there if you like, <laughs> or maybe it'll take you somewhere else far more shady. Um, so this is not necessarily the soul for getting to your next business meeting, but the principle is good, and I know that we now have an AR view in the Google Street View, in the Google Maps app, actually at the local level helps you find your, make decisions between left and right. Um, in terms of uh, uh, character building, um, we also found out bringing our characters very much, very viscerally into the real world, you actually had to start considering proportions. Like, of course you can overlay something, but the sense of if I'm too high, um, it's quite achy to walk around like this for a while. Also, I'm not looking at the street anymore. And then you do the thing that everyone else does, which is you're looking at the phone like this and you know, you never watch when you're crossing the road anymore. So his size is also related to something that feels comfortable for you to do for longer than five minutes, which if you've ever played AR, five minutes is an eternity with your arm outstretched. Um, so there's problems like that. And also the, the feeling that he, because he's in our world, that he should be at a size that he feels like he does look right next to the cars and the other objects. So that was quite interesting to, to sort of see a character come to life and <clears throat> in that way. <clears throat> um, and then obviously another wonderful little bonus is, so I mentioned the geolocation. <clears throat> we go to those geolocations and we release Pokemon. But this one's here like, well, my character can walk anywhere. So if I know where something particular is, I can make things happen to that character at that point. So this was an Easter egg we popped in where if you passed a hair salon, he'd get a new hairdo. So, I mean, if you think about that, this is just a throwaway idea, but it's a really vital and ingredient that could anchor 
plot-driven AR narrative in the real world as you move around, you know, as your character that you're uh, having some sort of story scenario with and you take them to another scene, maybe it's a bit more treasure hunty, puzzle-like, you go to another key area, you spawn a whole new storyline, plot line, the next scene, they react to their situation. What a novel way to tell a story. Um, we took away some really interesting learnings here. <laughs> uh, we found out how woefully inaccurate geolocation is, having assumed it was far more accurate. The red one is your GPS. This is just us trying to walk around the block, literally Chart Street, which is literally you know, our home. Uh, and then the blue one is the compass, which is also meant to be accurate. Um, so it's like, whoa, we can't rely on this to <laughs> um, follow this guy around because it's the vital difference between the guy being on the sidewalk or the road. I could get you ran over. So I was like, shit, we're making dangerous entertainment. Um, and then other fun problems, like the world isn't always flat. So there was lots of other really interesting <laughs> problems. Um, the AR kit and AR core help with that. The slam detection is always looking for planes on the ground to know where we should be placing you. But obviously, there are still other conflicts between where it thinks you are and where I am. Um, so yes, I'm not going to go into the semantics of that, but we learned a lot with that. And that took us on to the next problem. Um, Obviously, since then, things have moved on again. Um, you know, 5G is on the doorstep and it's being touted a lot. That means AR, the AR cloud can finally exist, um, or in Magic Leap's parlance, the magic verse. Um, as it says, it's like it's a persistent 3D digital copy of our real world, literally planted over hours. Obviously, you can see all as many functional and utility layers and smart information of things, layers that all can function for us and you know, do really great things in context of how we move around the real world. Well, obviously, Nexus as a company is interested in the top tier, the entertainment possibilities of this world. I mean, if 5G is promising data transfers of gigabytes and seconds, you can start to believe the tangibility of doing a virtual world that we can access at any point we want because it's, it is about getting all that heavy data into your phone uh, you know, in seconds and when you want it. And if we can power it like that, it means you also don't have to walk around with some epic brick of a phone because you know, they went thin and then they're getting fat again. Um, so we should be able to have lighter technology in our pocket as all the heavy computing is being done in the cloud and then literally all we need is being beamed back and displayed on the screen for us to interact with. So pretty cool. Um, so obviously, that doorway I keep mentioning, you know, how do I find that world? Uh, how, how do we get past the, the hot stepper problem and visual positioning system? So that's the 25 Chart Street Nexus is home in London. Um, what's happening here is we did a scan of our building using photogrammetry, made a 3D model of our world. Um, then we also brought that into 3D, did a conventional animation. Test here is like walk our little friend around a corner. Um, the uh, process called relocalization, and through your live camera is looking at the wall, the building there, and checking to see what it recognizes. Ah, yes, I got a model of that. It's supposed to also be able to work it out your, your position, orientation, in relation to that, and then plant that model accurately over the real building. Obviously, as you know, because we've masked our character around the 3D world, we remove the building, leave the information of the character that we want to display, and voila, he walks around the corner convincingly. One of the biggest illusion problems you have of a character that's trying to exist in the world but keeps walking over everything. Um, it works with degrees of inaccuracy ranging from centimeters to meters, but it's compelling. <laughs> um, so for our next foray into the metaverse to bring us back up to today, um, we decided to go here. You know, uh, ambition, take AR to the next level. Um, we didn't want AR to just appear anywhere anymore, you know, uh, or appear just in the right geolocation like Pokemon Go. We wanted it to inhabit a physical space, you know, be able to stand on that field, uh, interact with real world objects. Um, so yeah, started with a nice small venue, 
you know, only 100,000 seats. <laughs> no risk at all. Uh, I'm going to give you a very small taster of, of uh, the result. So, I mean, obviously, we didn't just rock up and <laughs> plant giant places on the AT&T Stadium. Uh, this was a long journey, uh, on and off work for nearly up to two years um, with our client Samsung um, before we got to this public showcase. Uh, the story begins, actually, back in a slightly safer area on Samsung's own campus in South Korea. Um, equally as ambitious, but with far less people watching us. Um, we made three activations, I'll show you two of them today, um, just essentially test ideas out on how people might engage with virtual entertainment, virtual you know, product in a real world environment. So a large scale spectacle allows you to test out volumetric capture, which you're familiar with, yes, 3D video recording of real live actors so that you can move around and see them from any angle, but it's actually real life performance. Um, also, a user-centered AR story, so where you know the story takes place in the environment around you, but you are kind of like the focal point of that story. And we also made a simple AR game as well, so they kind of touched on different themes. Um, this is one of our first tests, so it's a bit like the hot stepper as well. Like, right, let's get something to convincingly occlude around a, a large building. So, you know, you can see a little bit of error in there, but. It was a very good feeling when the whale shark first appeared around the side of the building. We're like, okay, this is, this is pretty good. And then, um, obviously, like I was saying, I was interested in exploring performances that make really nice physical contact with, with real-world elements. Um, if you've seen any volumetric capture in augmented reality, you know, you've downloaded... Uh, Justin Timberlake, or, or some model playing guitar, or some plum playing with pom-poms or something. A and after you've marveled at just having a three-dimensional, you know, hologrammatic person stood in front of you, it's, there's nothing there, right? It's a little bit soulless because they contact nothing. They're just standing there like, like this. You know, I, I'm... I've got no heed of, of anything around me. I've not touched an object. I've not interacted. I've not interacted with you. And it's like, oh, God. Um, so, again, this is all tricks and illusions. But um, so I worked hard with this dancer here to think about the space she'd work in and do performances that would use her surroundings to move off and interact with to make it a bit more believable. So I'm going to show you uh, one of our nearly finished uh, tests from uh, South Korea of uh, how some of this worked out. Like I say, this is a proof of concept, and if it was convincing, we got to take it to the public. Where should we sound on that? Hang on a second. I'm just going to flip out of this because there doesn't appear to be any sound on that. Let's try that again. There's still no sound on it. Never mind. Um, you'll get the sensation of it. I'm not sure why that's not playing without sound. It's very odd. <laughs> Which is a shame because it's, it's good to remember that sound really carries an experience. It really helps you believe in something that's happening in the scene and can cover a multitude of sins. <laughs> So you can all focus on the errors. Now it's silent. I mean, as you can see there, so I mean, she's, she moved really nice around the building. It's not quite working on the edge there. And obviously, those damn people keep walking in the way. <laughs> um, you know, we have some problems. But if you hold on to one key element, you can get away with a lot more. Um, and obviously, if someone puts a temporary lamppost up, as you'll see in a moment, in the middle of an area you've scanned, it's like, ah, <laughs> that wasn't there. And now it's in the way of my AR illusion. So there's a lot of 
extra considerations when you're, when you're um, trying to work on space. Oh, such a shame that the sound's not working on that. There's a very nice sound to this animation. But yeah, you know, it's, you can believe it, but the minute it walked through that post, it was like, ah. <laughs> but yeah, you get the impression. So we'll call that a success. <laughs> and um, so Samsung felt pretty confident we could go and take that somewhere for the public to conceive. So back to the stadium. Um, despite being a wholly uh, digital experience, and as I was mentioning before about the other installations, it is really important to assess these locations and look for the best places, or, or frankly, <laughs> the places that we can actually activate these experiences because they don't work everywhere, and, and this was probably the hardest building we could have picked. It's entirely covered in glass, means it's highly reflective, which means the scanning it was ridiculous, trying to get a read of that building and get a pinpoint was hard. You also shouldn't pick things that are perfectly symmetrical and very same looking. That doesn't help you anchor the camera to the place as well. So we possibly picked the worst building we could have picked. But we did make it to work in the end. Um, as I mentioned before, we made our 3D map of the stadium. We worked closely with a location technology company called Scape, who are very much about solving these visual positioning uh, problems uh, to help us get that accurate anchoring and put everything where we hope it should be. Uh, essentially, what we're doing is taking these giant structures and turning them into stages, if you like, that we can dream up AR performances. You know, we now could have put something on the roof, going around the outside of the building. As you can see, we've set up two things there. There's a, a footballer out front, and there's one interacting with the pitch. And obviously, then we went on and started making some early tests. When we first saw this one, we were like, oh, yes, this is going to be nice. Um, despite the the stuff on on the actual field, he still actually feels very believable in contact and uh, running on that world. And you know, he voids the ginormous jumbotron in the middle. This was like, this is this. This feels pretty epic. Um, at this point, I just want to mention, like, whilst we're just busy ourselves trying to make entertainment in spaces for the fans, um, I did want to consider a narrative thread. There is no, shall we say, larger story happening here, but. I wanted to consider it because to make better choices about the kind of activations we make for, for the people who are going there. You know, we want to consider the context of the audience. You know, not the football fans, okay? We all understand that from a storytelling peer view, but there's other levels that have now been introduced into this story. Like, um, why are they at the location? Yes, to see a football game to follow the Dallas Cowboys. Why are they at X location? And I don't mean at the stadium, I mean round the front you know, sat in the seat, w what are they doing, you know, at what moment in time is this happening, you know, what, I what is their emotional state, perhaps. So, to inspire our own thinking about the kind of activation we might do, we, we took that on board and I kind of likened it back to the story of a battle. You know, two opposing armies are coming to ha have great battle in an amphitheater in the middle. So, if you think of the fans' journey then, it's like, well, the, this army's banging on one side of the gate and not being allowed in until they open the gate. So they're anticipating the value. They're all, that's all the hype up chants are for. They're all like, come on, I'm going to kick you in the side's ass. And, and we can like play on that emotion and play to it. So we did an experience with these giant ones that are like, boom, boom, yeah, for honor and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of crass as big American sport, but you know, we won't go into that. <laughs> And then, obviously, inside, you want to see the battle itself. Now, obviously, the real battle is the game, and we shouldn't intrude on that because, obviously, that's more sacred, and that would be a disruptive form of interaction, and that's not a good solution. But there is a, uh, uh, an hour window where nothing's really happening. People are buying popcorn and hot dogs and finding their seats, and that was where we could do our own manifestation of the battle where you <coughs> sorry, saw yourself um, going one-on-one -on -one with robots and trying to score a touchdown. And then obviously we had this idea about victory or defeat where you could get something when we finished. We didn't make that one in the end because uh, it's getting dark and that's still quite a challenge for augmented reality. And then obviously we had this thing called Hall of Heroes because obviously after every epic battle, heroes emerge. And for us, that's obviously a, a cheap win of, we recorded star football players, so let's let some people take selfies with them. You know, and it totally works for the fans. And it's another way for us to test another kind of engagement with augmented reality. So that kind of, that idea sort of 
fans out like this. Visitors arrive, they go through these kind of stages. So they're not available all the time. They're available in the sort of contextually aware slots. Also, while you, um, the game was being played, we flipped to um, showing live stats that we projected over the field while the players were there as well. It's just another way to use the AR technology and prove its validity as it's con mirroring something television can do, but I can have the same now um, looking on pitch side. So obviously, again, we took our learnings from Suwon and um, you know worked with the. Is it going to run? Wow. Why? Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, you know, we still wanted to create performances that would play with your expectations. This is a, a running back called uh, Zeke Elliott, and he ha does this feed me motif every time he scores a touchdown. Um, and this is kind of how it, how it worked in the end. Um, we learn a really great lesson in Sue One. The, the sense of scale is such a fantastic and strong thing. We were dubious it was going to work through, uh, through your phone, but it actually turned out to be still a very strong sensorial thing. And also um, on this second one here, which is Dak Prescott, who's their big quarterback. Um, you can't get every detail right, as you probably, you know, if you're being sharp eyed, you'll see not everything fits. But the thing is, getting key parts right really helps. So, like, I, I love the way his hands like, poof, poof, go on there, and that, that really carries everything else that happens. And there might be a few little occlusion errors and stuff going on, but that first part, that first contact with reality really carries you through. And also the rubble raining down at you sort of sucks you into the scene and, and removes the detachment of realizing you're holding this thing to your face. Um, this is one of my favorites. We appear to have completely lost sound, which is a... Okay. No sound. But yeah, I mean, um, the main thing you're looking at here is uh, the contact with the ground and the play runs. What you may not have noticed that is kind of casually part of that is the augmented reality player used the Jumbotron to defeat the robot. He, he makes contact with that sort of slow descent, changes timing, and stomp the robot down. And uh, it's those wonderful little contextual moments that you're not playing up too much that really bring them into the real world as well. And, and if you thought it was easy, you don't always win, as this one shows you here. So yeah, he can give you a beat down. Um, and just to prove this is really working, we have other angles. So there's a high seat version. And we even took a drone up into the sky as well. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and we still got a pretty good read from up there as well. So yeah, that was a, a pretty successful <laughs> um, outing there. And if this plays with sound, this will be much better, but we'll see what happens. Um, this is just a bit of a cut of the, of the best bits. Oh yeah, there we go, sound's back. And so that's um, all I have to share with you today. Um, if you want to ask me any questions about this particular project, um, feel free. I don't know how much time we've got left. I think I've gone quite quickly. <laughs>